guys are here last Sunday, um, we were at Hillcrest Park, and um, it just was a blast. Um, like, we went from Hillcrest back to gloomy and rainy Sundays again. Um, but it was muddy, it was wet still, uh, but it was enjoyable, and we were able to connect with different folks. So I got a chance to chat with, you know, a few of you guys, and I noticed, you know, just looking around, a lot of you guys were chatting um, together, and that was um, really just such a precious time. And the food, let me just pause here, the food was delicious. <laughs> if you guys didn't notice the spread, um, I actually wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. There was homemade pancit, there was homemade red chili quiles, there was bubogi gyoza, there was this Japanese style savory pancakes that Michael made, um, there was Costco pizza, and then there's Subway sandwiches. Um, and then also, you know, on top of that, there were the desserts, so homemade cookies, homemade lemon bars, um, and then Ava Stricker, who's not here, um, she made a special cake with marshmallow figures on the top. Um, I, I know that because my girls were like, I want that cake with marshmallow. I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, but it was delicious. And so you could taste the love in the diverse cultures and diets that were represented. Were represented. So if you missed that Sunday, we missed you. So that Sunday, it, it was an intentional break um, from our normal worship service. And that break allowed us to kind of press into different experiences and different values uh, of our church that we might normally not normally get to you know, on a Sunday like this. And we had space to see, we had space to connect uh, with one another. And so if you missed that Sunday again, um, we are building intentional times throughout our year that we get to do that. And so um, worshiping together isn't simply just, you know, worship, you know, singing worship and then a message, but it's talking together, it's connecting. So, and then let me plug again, June 2nd through the 4th uh, camping retreat. It's actually at Chibugo Canyon, only a regional park. So... On a Sunday, you could probably get home, or on the weekend, you could probably get home in like 45 minutes. So if you forget something, technically speaking, you can swing home and grab it. And, <laughs> and no one would know, because, yeah. So, um, anyhow, all right. So this past week, um, so, so again, last Sunday was a break, right? This past week was another major break, or what I would like to call a, a disruption to our normal schedule and our normal business. Um, anybody want to guess what that disruption was? Daylight saving. Somebody feel it? Daylight saving. Daylight saving time. <laughs> and to be quite frank, I, I dislike daylight saving time. <laughs> so, gotta be great for that. My wife and I, um, we were wrangling kids at 10 p.m. There was one night um, where our youngest was up at 10.30. And she, she literally said, what, she's not tired, right? She said that at 10.30 <laughs> p.m. as a four-year-old. So. That set the evening, and then my mornings were all off to, you know, as I was running, uh, rushing really to get three groggy kids up and ready for school. All at the same time that I'm like, this is absolute. So DST, uh, daylight saving, threw off our normal sleeping patterns. It caused a disruption to our sleep routines. But in the midst of that was a hyper awareness on my side um, of a lack of, um, of consistent sleep. And so, um, it, it was kind of in the midst of this week that God began to challenge a bit of my perspective on gratitude. Uh, one of the readings, I, I, uh, we started this Bible reading accountability thing with the two Elliots. Um, and so Psalm 3 and 4 um, had two very key verses that I just like honed in on. So Psalm 3 verse 5 says, I lie down and sleep, I wake again because the Lord sustains me. And then in Psalm 4 verse 8 it says, in peace. I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in sleep. And then I grabbed breakfast with Pastor Dave, and he was mentioning the story of this one pastor. Not, not actually story, he was there. Uh, but there was this pastor that had seven points about gratitude. So point one was, I woke up this morning. Point two was, I woke up this morning. And point three was, I woke up this morning. And on and on until point seven. And so I'm like, okay, I get the point now. But the thing is, I don't know if I would have given attention to the reality that um, sleep was such a gift from God if I myself wasn't totally sleep deprived. And so because my sleep was off, I was more alert to the steam around sleep and also the gift of waking up each morning. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I take that absolutely for granted because I don't wake up in the morning and say, God, thank you. I get another day. I'm more like, I don't even think, I just, I just act, because I get my kids up and ready for school. 
But I'm realizing uh, just how deep of a gift that each morning is, and I get to receive that. And what happened was, as I was sitting with that realization and, and hear from God, it allowed me moments this week where uh, instead of grumpiness and attitude, I was able to be present to my kids in the midst of their grumpiness and their attitude. And it was a beautiful experience. Fleeting and very short-lived, absolutely. But it deepened an area of my heart that said, hey, there's something more that, that I can be grateful for. And so not only was I practicing small um, areas of gratitude, but um, it, it, it reached the depth of my soul and my heart that I was like, I, I needed that to be awakened. And so the season of Lent, um, you know, we, we started this, uh, it's Wednesday, February 22nd, uh, which starts, well, started with Ash Wednesday, and then it ends on Thursday, April 6th, uh, during Passion Week. And so we're already a few weeks in, recognize that. Um, but Lent is one of the five seasons, if you're not familiar with Lent, one of the five seasons of the liturgical calendar, so along with Advent, Christmas, Easter, and ordinary time. So Lent comes from the 40 days that Jesus was tempted uh, in the desert, uh, as he was tempted by Satan. And just as that 40-day period was Jesus' preparation before his ministry, Lent for us is also 40 days of preparing our hearts for the celebration of Easter. And Lent, typically, it's, it's marked as more of a solemn, kind of reflective season um, as, as people take uh, note of where their hearts are at and how things are going and, and where sin is at, right? It's, it's, it's hard. But it's, it's a preparation period. Now, um, it would be easy, it'd be easy to skip over the season and continue with regular programming, if you will. Or we could avoid the solemn nature of Lent and, and focus on more of the hope and celebration, because that's what Easter is going to be about. However, seasons, seasons are deeply important. And I know it's hard to say that here in California, because I feel like we only have two, sunny and not so sunny. But in other parts of our country, um, everyday life is deeply impacted by the seasons that they're in. And so seasons remind us that um, there's a time for everything, and seasons are also a reminder that we don't have as much control as we hope to have or maybe try to have. And just as daylight saving uh, time was a disruption to my family's sleep routine, that also helped me be aware of something I might have missed. I believe Lent offers us a break, a disruption, a change in the season that might open us up to things we wouldn't normally give attention to. So today, yes, we're talking about, um, it's Lent, but we're talking about lament today. And if you're familiar with lament, uh, then you know this, this can be a heavy topic, because Lent, address, uh, Lent, lament addresses pain, suffering, and grief. And, and if I could have, maybe, maybe I would have given you guys a heads up. Um, and, and that would have been, you know, time for us to prepare our hearts, and, and really, for you guys to choose whether you guys would come today or not. So thank you guys for being here. But I think there's a problem um, with pain that this addresses, which is that when we look at pain, when we look at grief, and when we look at suffering, we don't always get the luxury of choosing when that happens to us. A lot of that blindsides us, and we just have to deal with it. Revelation um, 21.4 says this, and I think it'll be up there. He will wipe away, uh, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things that's passed away. Revelation 21.4. I know that has brought a lot of comfort to many, many people over generations and generations and generations. But the reality of this revelation is that when will that happen? When do we get to experience that? Not until we're in heaven. And so the logical conclusion is that on this side of heaven, while we're still here on earth, we can almost, in a sense, expect that suffering, death, and sorrow will be around us. If you guys were here last year, you might recall that I spoke on lament. Um, it's, it's become a topic that's kind of caught my interest. And that message focused more specifically on pain and suffering. Um, in, in a way, so in a way, today, you might consider today kind of a part two, uh, in that I'm going to focus a little more on the practice of lament. Um, however, uh, there is one point that I want to um, revisit um, from last year, and, and the point I want to revisit 
for today as a starting point is that um, our, our pain needs to be seen and our pain needs to be given space to breathe in order for healing to happen. Uh, my daughters have gone through this phase where um, they, they love band-aids and I have three girls and so we've got a lot of very colorful and character-filled band-aids. We've got all these different sizes. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that plays into it. But they're in this phase where any sort of owie, even if there's no bleeding, <laughs> um, warrants a band-aid. And the thing is that they love it so much that they are not willing to take it off. And so my wife and I have to constantly remind them, hey, you, you need to let your owie breathe so that it can heal properly, so that it can actually heal. And so at some point, Emily, Eleanor, you meet whatever, whoever it is, we've got to take that band-aid off. We've got to let it breathe. See, when I think of a healthy human being, one who is flourishing or even in the context of a mature believer, we most likely think of someone who is living a good life, someone who is, who is successful, and perhaps someone who actually has their craft together. What about a healthy, flourishing church? We might think of a community that is uh, what, growing in size, uh, there's new ministries that are being launched. A um, number of people are getting baptized. People are making professions of faith. Maybe even there's a growing budget, right? and, and just money-wise. But <clears throat> while these markers um, certainly hold weight, and they have value, I think our understanding of healthy and flourishing falls incredibly short if it doesn't also hold that space for suffering and pain. And I'm not talking about um, ministries that you go to if, you know, if, you're, if you're in grief or if you're suffering, um, that you go to that ministry. And then when you're better, you come rejoin the larger community. I'm not talking about that, that vision. What I'm talking about is a vision of a healthy and flourishing church where both celebration and suffering can be held together. See, during the season of Lent, we give space for our grief and suffering because our faith holds that both celebration and suffering are together. God invites us to both praise and lament. And although Lent may be a typical season to press into these spaces, it should not be the only time that we do so. But we do need the space to practice it. We do need that practice of giving voice to areas of grief. And we do need to exercise it all together. So today as we explore, as we explore grief and lament, um, I want us to consider it in the context of community. And the reason why is I believe when a community is able to hold grief and suffering well, the personal grief, hidden suffering, has space to breathe and can be witnessed and seen. So imagine with me, what would a healthy church look like where both celebration and suffering are held together? What would a community look like where we don't need to be ashamed of and hide our pain and suffering? And then what would a healthy voicing and witnessing of pain and suffering look like? I want to be very, very clear that today um, you, we're not getting the golden ticket here to these questions. We're not walking away from today with answers. Uh, there's no practical A to Z to living out this type of community. The reality is that this type of community can only be lived out and experienced in the season to season, person to person, suffering to cele suffering, and celebration to celebration moments of life. So in short, it's going to take all of us trying and failing, pressing in and pulling back, all the while leaning into the faith that anchors us to Christ himself. So what is lament? Pain's clear. We know what that is. But what is lament? This is the definition that I found just Googling. 
Lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It's that deep moaning, it's that, that sorrow, the pain, the, the grieving, it's the, it's the crying out experiences. And we see Jesus lament the death of his friend, Lazarus. In John 11, 35, it says that Jesus wept. He grieved the loss of his friend. We see Jesus again uh, in prayerful lament in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was arrested. Is that his heart was aching, he was, he was longing and crying, and he was crying out blood. And Jesus again in prayerful lament while he's on the cross. Father, would you take this cup from me? Isaiah 53 says this about Jesus. He had no beauty or majesty to attract, to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. So Jesus was familiar with pain. He voiced out laments in his life and in his relationships. And if lament is a practice that our Lord lived out and embodied, then that's something that we can receive as a gift in our life and in our faith. See, lament is not only done by God, but in our faith, we know that he is, it, it is heard by God. And there's a promise that God gives us in Scripture, where it says that Jesus is near the brokenhearted. And so, a, a lot of, um, I have a couple of points um, before we're going to kind of go into a space of, of reading through a lament. Um, but I want to comment on where I got it from, because um, a lot of this is, is a process of learning, and is a pro process of practicing. There's a, 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 an author, a pastor uh, named Sun Cheng Ra, um, I think I said his name right, and he, he wrote a commentary, it's really his, his book on Lamentations, and it just was beautiful, and it gave for me um, both a lot of language, but a lot of perspective on what lament is. And so maybe my, my, my first point within the area of lament is that lament is both, uh, it is permission. Lament is permission. So here's where we need to start. Saying that we're lamenting uh, isn't something you might hear in your day to day, right? So if you're sitting here and someone says, says to you, hey man, I'm, I'm lamenting right now. It sounds a little awkward, a little bit weird, a little out of context. And the reason why is um, lament as a word and as a term, it, it's not common language. It's actually really odd if, if we heard that. Yet there is a place where we can find lament being verbalized, and that is in our liturgy. And so when we include lament into our liturgy, we are helping to give voice to the pain that our community might be carrying. Our liturgy then is giving permission to let our pain and suffering breathe. It becomes built-in space or rhythms where we enter into an intentional season of sitting with pain and suffering. It gives us a way out of awkward spaces and it gives us a way into these spaces where maybe in our hearts it, it's hard for us to break out. It's hard for us to voice it. But it adds a rhythm where we get to do that. And not only that, but lament gives us uh, permission to say that things are not okay. When Pastor Jay Lee talked about um, uh, 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 what was that movie was called Encanto, but one of the characters, right, in her song, it climaxed at saying, "I'm not okay. <clears throat> I'm not doing well." Lament gives us permission to say that we don't need to be asked by someone else. We don't need to wait, but it gives us permission to say, "I'm not doing." See, injustice, pain, and suffering are all realities of our world on this side of heaven. And so lament gives us permission to, to um, not only say that we're not okay, but it also gives us permission to not accept the status quo. See, much of our world says um, to, to be successful, to be flourishing, is to look a certain way. That you both celebrate, that you are... are uh, um, able to articulate your achievements, that you're able to talk about um, what you've done in life, that you can show your resume, that you can show your house, that you can flash your car. But that's a false identity of what we are offered in this world. 
and certainly not as the church. So Lent gives us permission to not accept the status quo. See, Lent, it allows ourselves to be ourselves in that space. Because many of us, especially in the church and in our church here, that isn't our pursuit. But we hear it from our families. We hear it from our coworkers. We see it around us. There's temptation to want to give in to that. But there's permission and limit to say that that's not what this world is to offer. The second one is that lament um, is protest. In the height of some of the racialized violence, um, and, you know, I think maybe 2014 was, was uh, one of the peaks, but after that period, there were a number of peaks, a number of people um, that were brutally um, slaughtered because of their race and their culture. And out of that, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement had, um, had pushed forward. And the reason why I say this uh, is because over these last couple months, uh, my wife and I, and, and in different areas, I've been in spaces where um, I've heard the Black Lives Matter um, talk about in ways that is completely wrong has been taken away from our black brothers and sisters and has been used as a weapon against them. But what was the Black Lives Matter movement? It was the lament. It was our black brothers and sisters saying, this is enough. I cannot stand on the side watching our brothers and sisters get brutalized on the street. It was a process to say, this is the line and no more. See, limit can, becomes a way to draw attention to the pain and suffering experienced by the voices that have been silenced on the margins. Limit holds the line of human dignity. It says to injustice, this is it. It will not go past this line. It also gives an outlet for injustice to be voiced. And so when we think of lament as protest, I think of this, it's truth telling to our neighbors. It begs the question to say, how are you listening if you are at home? See, there's a tendency, um, especially here in American culture, that we see something we see tension, we see conflict, we see some issue, and we assume, we assume what it is, we project onto that, and we diagnose the problems that we see. But we don't ever listen. We don't ever listen. And so when we think of lament as protest, I want us to be thinking of questions like this. How am I listening to the grief of others? What is being communicated in their grief? Or what is being communicated in our grief? Lament calls out, and it needs a witness, because pain needs to be heard, pain needs to be seen, pain needs to have someone that can acknowledge it and give it validity. Not that it isn't by itself, but when others see it, it gives them a whole other level where healing can actually happen. My last point that I want to pull out is that lament is prayer. The very, very core of what lament is, why it is in the church, why we would talk about it year after year, why we need to, to um, raise the banner to say that lament needs to be a practice within the church, is that lament is prayer. It's rooted in our faith. Romans 8.26 has always been a verse um, and a truth that um, has brought both comfort and, um, and a lot of mystery. And Romans 8.26 says this. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
Have you ever been in a season in your life where you just had no words to describe what it's going on? Have you experienced areas of grief that you do not have the strength to put words to it? Have you been around others that all they have is silence? The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Not simply out of righteousness to say, I have made right this person and I am interceding on their behalf. There is that. There's also the piece where it says, I see you and I know you. And I am interceding on your behalf to our Father so that he would see you. He would be with you. See, the Lord is in our grief and he is in our pain. Because lament is rooted in the hope that God will see it's anchored in a relationship of trust. And to help us, um, I know you know we can talk about lament all day long. We can talk about what it is. We can um, think about it. We can do all this stuff about it. But the only kind of real way to integrate lament um, is to hear it, is to see it. And so in this part of our time, I want us to actually read a lament from Scripture. And, and, and the reason why is lament can, right, it can seem like a foreign language. But it's an encouragement to talk to God. And perhaps one of our practices that I've done is, oh, just share your heart with God. But what if you don't have words to share what's on your heart? And so it helps to hear. It helps to borrow words. It helps to hear phrases. And even identify emotions that we might be having that we don't know. And so I, I'm curious, um, has anybody read Lamentations at all in the last year or two? Okay, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> but everyone else? Generally speaking? Okay, all right. You guys blew the theory up, so. Anyhow. Well, actually, let me ask this. Did you guys read Lamentations as like a verse or two from like a Bible verse of the day app? Or did you actually read a whole chapter or the whole book? <laughs> but Lamentations is a very odd book. It's, it's peculiar, and, and it feels like an outlier, and our tendency is to want to avoid it for very clear reasons. And so let me give us some context before we actually read Lamentations. Lamentations, um, it's written after the fall of Jerusalem. So 586, 587 B.C., Jerusalem was utterly destroyed, and the people were sent into exile. Babylon as a nation, as an empire, was absolutely brutal, held no mercy, killed slaughter, and destroyed everything that there could be destroyed. And so Lamentations is written from the perspective of, of a sole survivor, not a soul, but a survivor, grieving over the loss and destruction of the city and its people. And so Lamentations is very peculiar, and that God's voice is absent. At no point throughout those five chapters of, of Lamentations will you identify this is God speaking. And what does it do when, it, when God's voice is absent? It gives full attention to what is described in that book. And what is described in that book of Lamentations is pain and suffering and lament. And what's beautiful and, and amazing, and, and I think this is partly what caught my attention, is that there is structure to it still. And there's very clear reasons why. Chapters 1, uh, literally chapters 1 through 4 are all acrostic. And if you're not familiar with acrostic, it's, it's a poem where it's structured around um, the Hebrew alphabet. And so in the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters. And so chapters 1, 2, and 4 are 22 verses. Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, 2, and 4, yes. Chapter 3, as the middle of the book, is 66 verses. And for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, they give three verses to it. And as you read through Lamentations 3, we did this last year, um, I had us uh, kind of take note of, of how the emotions go, right? And it wasn't linear, it was this constant up and down. And it feels like you're on this roller coaster where your emotions are getting jerked up, around and around. But then we get to Lamentations 5. And that pattern of acrostic poetry is in a way it tossed out the window, and it's just a poem. 
And so what that has done really it has helped to, to contain the grief, has helped to give a structure to the grief. Because for a lot of us, when we think of grief and pain, it is so immense that we don't know where to start. And so Lamentations gives us a way out of our grief and a way into spaces of being heard and spaces of being um, seen. And so um, we're going to read Lamentations 5, chapter 5. But as we read it, I want us to all pay attention to what might be getting stirred up in us. What thoughts and perhaps um, emotions surface for you? So let's do this together. Remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We have become fatherless. Our mothers are widows. We must buy water we drink. Our wood can be had only at a price. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We are weary and find no rest. We submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our ancestors sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. Slaves rule over us, and there's no one to free us from their hands. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the desert. Our skin is hot as an oven, feverish from hunger. Women have been violated in Zion and virgins in the towns of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Young men toil at the millstones. Boys stagger under loads of wood. The elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim for Mount Zion, which lies desolate with jackals crawling over it. You, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond Lamentations 5 is a communal lament. And what happens in a communal lament is that it, it invites different perspectives and invites different voices into this. When we think of lament in our context, um, I, my, my hope and my prayer is that um, we, we are a community that is able to hold suffering well. I think. But the issue with suffering and grief is that you can never take it for granted. So from one person to another, from one suffering to another suffering, it is all unique. And so our ability to be present to suffering really relies on our resilience and our faith. But it becomes a practice and it becomes a rhythm and it becomes a, a built-in culture. The other thing about Lamentations 5 and what's uniquely, um, I, I guess, disturbing is that in that last two verses, there's a moment of hope. Lord, renew us. But then where does it end? It ends in a cliffhanger. Will God come through? I have wondered, and, and I was able to process this out with um, Elliot, Pastor over here. Um, why is lament, why is lament um, and grief in, in this area of our faith, um, why has it become such an interest for me? Yes, there are pain points in my life, but I think those pain points are matched by the grace points. And I cannot think of any better definition of the good news how God is present to our grief. Yes, there's sin. But sin has caused grief. 
greater. And the greatest magnitude of love is to say that there is someone that sees you when you're in pain. 1 Peter 2, 2-4, says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, I will say, we have been healed. God has taken the shame, the suffering, the sorrow upon himself. And this is our answer to that cliffhanger and lamentation spot. There is hope. So as lament is permission, protest, and prayer, as lament helps to reveal the injustice, the, the ugliness, the pain that is there, Lament also realizes that there's a God who sees and a God who is with us. And that is the greatest hope that we get to experience. And so my intention out of today and out of this exploration of of grief and lament isn't that um, we would sit in our pain all day long. And it isn't necessarily that we would be um, trauma-informed and and grief-oriented and and start all these ministries, like, those are great things. But how do we as a people become identity, right? How do we live into that? And so there is something after grief. There's something after suffering. There's both celebration and suffering. There's both praise and lament. But out of that, as we walk in and, and through that, is that we become people of hope. A genuine, eternal hope, where hope seems non-existent. So let me close in prayer. God, as we um, let some of um, today just settle in and settle into our hearts, and know um, that it has stirred up in some of us things that we might have um, not, maybe perhaps not wanted to visit today. And has stirred up some things that maybe we have uh, overlooked or pushed aside. And my hope and my prayer too is that maybe it has stirred in some of us uh, a curiosity to know, a curiosity to be present. Ways that we might love uh, one another in a deeper context. But through all of it, God, um, I pray that today might be anchored in the ever-present reality that we live as people of hope. God, this world is brutal. This world is hurtful in so many ways. At the same time, the world is full of joy. The world is beautiful in life. The world offers celebration. Ultimately, God, We hold it as you hold it. And it is all precious in your sight. And so we, as your people, can be people of celebration and people of suffering. That we, as your people, as your sons and your daughters, as you you give breath of life to us, we can both sing out praises and speak out in the men. And through all of that, God, you receive it as our worship. And so, Lord, would you continue to move in our hearts? Um, I I pray you would help to just minister to us wherever we're at.